going on, guys? This is Brian and Jack from Superman's Comics. It is Thursday night. This is the Bolo Show, where we are recapping the week's hottest comic book releases. We're talking about first appearances. We're talking about reader buzz. We're talking about variant buzz. And, of course, Jack has that long-term play. So if this is your first time here, smash that subscribe button. Hit click that bell so you get notified of all the future videos. We do a lot of comic book and pop culture content on this channel. And if you're here all the time, do us a favor and smash that like video. Share this video out with your friends if you're watching it during the premiere. Let's get everyone in the chat for this. We are one week away from Christmas. Well, a little bit less than a week now. And with that being said, we are going to tell you next week we will not have a bolo show. But Jack, you will still be putting out a list, correct? That's right. There will still be a bolo list everywhere you see the bolo list. Currently, all the social media platforms in which uh, we at Simpleman's Comics distribute the list. But it will be abbreviated, obviously, because it's a really it's a short release week. There isn't a ton of releases, and actually, a lot of comic shops already got next week's releases in this week with their current release week um, inventory. So. It's going to be a short week, but we're still going to get that list out to you. Right. And as always, this show is brought to you by Slabbed Heroes. Slabbedheroes.com. Good old Nick Dortman. Get those modern guaranteed 9 8s at a great price. And one thing we haven't mentioned that might, people might not be aware of is Nick Slabbed Heroes himself actually has his own YouTube channel now. So if you want to check out behind the scenes, so what goes through the man's head himself, he's got a lot of great videos on there. So check out Slabbed Heroes on YouTube as well. But we'll go ahead and bring this week's list up on the screen. Jack, anything stick out? What went through your mind? What was going on? I know this list might be made by you, but it belongs to the social media of comic books, correct? Right, yeah. So, you know, like we always talk about, we, we monitor social media trends, what people are talking about. And we try to condense that into a short list that kind of gives you as you walk into your local comic shop and do comic book day, an overview of what is happening up to the minute within the secondary market as it relates to books releasing this week. And, you know, this was a real balanced list, Brian. Um, you know, I think it was heavy in the reader buzz section as far as numbers, but there are some heavy hitters down in that variant buzz section. Yeah, there's a lot of good books on this list. I read a couple this week, unlike last week. I was able to get some books read on New Comic Book Day. Just a reminder, this is recorded on Wednesday night. So we can live premiere it on Thursday with that chat. Get people in there, get that conversation going. But we're not going to hold it up. We're going to get into it right now with the first appearances for this week. Starting with He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse number two. Real quick, before we get into this book, there was some breaking news that came out yesterday. They are doing another Netflix series, right? For He-Man and Masters of the Universe? Yes, we already knew that this was, you know, going to be a thing, but it seems like now we're progressing ahead with it. Um, and it's always a big deal when you can take things from that first step of initial kind of like option announcement to when things become a lot more formalized and we're moving forward. So really exciting for all the old school Masters of the Universe fans. And yeah. Unless you haven't been watching, if you haven't been watching this channel, then you wouldn't know, but huge Masters of the Universe fan here. And I actually, this is one of the first books I read this week. I liked it. There was a lot going on in it. Anti-Eternia, He-Man shows up, of course. And we get Skeletor, different multiverse Skeletor. This is the one that took place basically in space. So it was almost like a Star Wars Masters of the Universe. Yeah, so we get a we get a taste of that um, less than popular version of uh, He Man that came out with that uh, that kind of like a second cartoon series um, toy reboot line, um, and you know we're doing we're gonna get kind of like first appearances throughout this series. I think as we get to meet all these um, different masters of the multiverse. But again, we've talked about this series, whether it was here on the Bolo Show, whether it was on the Last Call Show. This is a, a really fun series that, re that reminds us a lot of Spider-Verse. And it's an absolutely creative way to introduce a lot of people to the Masters of the Universe property. Yeah, we saw that. Um, hope I'm saying the name right. Keltor. <laughs> Get, yeah. Gets Skeletor staff in this one. There's, a, there's actually a lot of death in this issue. So I was surprised. Not surprised, but at the same time surprised when you're used to growing up watching the Master of the Universe cartoon. But either way, great issue. Um, I don't see it garnering a lot of buzz unless you're a Masters of the Universe fan. I enjoyed it. And 
even if you just pick it up and give it a read, I think you would enjoy the story as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, number one for those who are kind of looking at it from a secondary market perspective is probably going to be the end-all, be-all king being the first anti-attorney He-Man, which we've talked about as a character who has legs. But I tell you what, we've also talked at length over 2019. It's almost the end of the year, right? So it's kind of important to start taking a look back and looking at all of the kind of commonalities of philosophy, Brian, that we've had on the channel over the year. One of the things that we've talked about frequently is sets and the ability to put um, books together as a set. And this being a kind of a short mini series that tells one congruent story, and especially a story that we have been so high on, I really think that sets of this series are going to do extremely well in the long run. Right. And not to mention, we've said it before, but the Zen Hyak Lee covers are gorgeous. Out of there, I mean, out of this world. But the next book that we're going to talk about for first appearances is DC gave us a brand new Suicide Squad this year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's kind of from, I'll say, really growing in popularity writer Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor's been around for a while, but he's really getting a, a solid uh, Twitter buzz where people are, are digging his stuff. And uh, this is his kind of new version, new take on Suicide Squad. We get a lot of new characters, but they caution me right off the bat. Not to fall in love with any of these characters and for good reason right brian yeah i mean it says on the cover it, at the end of this issue half the team will be dead and it's true so, yeah so you know um big uh new team um i did not read this book brian did um there's a replacement for amanda waller correct brian yeah so amanda waller spoilers sorry let's just say spoilers in there um it starts off you don't even see the old team. You see some of these new characters and they're introduced to them right off the bat real quick. These names kind of reminds me like an action movie or a trailer where the names pop up while they're in the middle of the action and they're introducing these characters and they're taking out this nuclear submarine fleet. And then the old Suicide Squad team comes in and there's a new leader. He's telling them what to do. And a lot of people are ignoring his orders and the new characters are taking out some of the old characters and vice versa. And then they come down and Amanda Waller comes off the helicopter and she pretty much just says, yeah, I quit. And there's this new character, Locke, or Lok, L-O-K. And, and I was curious because there was another character kind of with that same name from Green Lantern back in 2005. So I didn't know if this was the same character or not. But looking at um, some articles online, they're kind of saying that it's not the same character and that this is the first appearance. So... If you like first appearances, this could be a book to pick up and, and stash away. Who knows what might happen? And if Amanda Waller stays gone, who knows? I mean, you always associate Amanda Waller with Suicide Squad, right? So, Right. But, I mean, even within the uh, CW network, yeah. they actually killed off Amanda Waller and had Lila Michaels take over. So there is precedent here for DC Comics to make that switch. And, um, way, way different Amanda Waller in the CW show, though, right? <laughs> yes, very different. Very well, different. A little bit more attractive. <laughs> yes, it was, very, it was a very different character. And to me, the best Amanda Waller they've ever done is the animated CCH Pounder. Yeah. Um, Amanda Waller, that's the one that I'm you know, so accustomed to. I did like the one in the Suicide Squad movie. Was it Viola Davis? or I think her Yeah, name Viola was... Davis is a great actress. Yeah. There's no doubt. Um, but CCH Pounder, her voice to me is what you, know, you kind of grow up thinking is Amanda Waller. Exactly. So then we're going to move on to the next one we're talking about first appearances is Avengers number 28. Now we start seeing late Tuesday night, a lot of the websites, a lot of the blogs, uh, you start seeing spoilers and news kind of sprinkling out on this and people are starting to get high on it, right? Right. People love mashup characters. You know, we, we know that. Um, we've seen that several times in the market. Um, this is a first appearance that I think would get me excited a couple of years ago because we've seen situations like this play out and then be kind of homaged up in the MCU, but obviously with the fate of Black Widow in the MCU, even though we're about to have a Black Widow movie, of course, if you're not aware, it's more of a prequel. It happens kind of in the past. Um, it doesn't play with the kind of current storyline. And if you saw Endgame, you know exactly where Black Widow ends up. But uh, here we get kind of a mashup character with War Machine and Black Widow. We have uh, the War Widow, where she gets kind of the uh, kind of like a cosmic war machine um, costume. Pretty cool looking, to be honest with you. Great uh, splash page reveal. So that made the rounds, like Brian said, Tuesday night uh, drummed up a lot of interest in this issue. Right. And with that, I mean, that's going to wrap up first appearances for the week. So again, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button for us. It really helps us out, lets our video get found by other people. And if you are a sports fan, especially college football, 
I am wearing my almighty Florida State beanie. 2013 seems like a long time ago now, but we just had early signing period. Florida State, I think, did pretty good with the new head coach. But a lot of people are like, what's that got to do with comic books? So we're just going to move right on into the reader bus <laughs> section. The first one we want to talk about on that reader bus section is that Year of the Villain Hell Arisen number one. Right, so now we're getting ready to kick off kind of uh, the next phase, I think, of, uh, you know, Scott Snyder, um, his career at DC Comics as we get into his next Dark Knights um, series. That's why he's wrapping up Justice League and, and getting ready to move on to that next part, finishing up um, another book that we're going to talk about a little later, but, uh, his last individual Batman story he says he's going to write. Um, but Hell Arisen, we get The Secret Six. Um, you can call it a first appearance. It's going to be argued one of those cameo first full with some other issues that we've talked about previously. So it's just not something I wanted to kind of walk down that that argument. There's two books that really spotlight um, this Secret Six team this week. Um, so, you know, obviously this this version of the Secret Six is the Batman Who Laughs um, kind of infected six. Uh, I, we've talked about it, very cool, very dark, uh, and something that maybe. You, I'm not a huge alternate version of a character um, fan. I mean, there's some exceptions, like an anti-attorney, a He-Man. Um, but over the last several years, we've been proven, whether it's Batman or Labs or any of the dark multiverse characters, whether it's Cosmic Ghost Rider, um, that Spider, even going back to spider one, that this can work if done right, and this dark multiverse stuff is done very well. Yeah, this is one of the ones that I picked up but haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, so if you guys have read it, let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat. What do you guys think about this? So then the next book we want to talk about is that final book in the Donny Cates run on Guardians of the Galaxy. And we're talking about Guardians of the Galaxy number 12. Right, so this is the conclusion, not just the Guardians of the Galaxy, but as you can see from the cover, all of um, Donny Cates' cosmic stories that he's told over the last year or so. Death of Inhumans and with Lockjaw or, um, you know, the Silver Surfer Black with the, the Fallen One version of Silver Surfer. Um, and then going right into, of course, this title, Guardians of the Galaxy. And this has been highly anticipated. It's kind of been an under-the-radar run. We've talked about that several times. Um, and, that, you know, it's one of those things where will it get respect down the line? I, I'm not so sure. Um, I think that Venom and obviously the absolute carnage of Venom dominated most of the attention for Don and Cates. It's almost like people have forgotten. Even some of his independent releases that he's had um, on the slate, we haven't heard much talk about, say, Baby Teeth or Redneck, um, as most of the focus on him has gone to his Venom releases. But Guardians of the Galaxy wraps up, gets ready for that Al Ewing number one. And we talked about an FLC show is coming. Uh, there were a lot of ratio variants for this book. Um, we see the Funko variant, high ratio Funko variant is kind of interesting. Previews did. Um, there are, uh, a, like I said, a number of, of different variants that I think it's pretty typical of uh, kind of a Donny Cates release. There's some great, some great art, but everybody's here for the story. So it'll be interesting to see. I haven't got a chance to read this one yet. Let us know in the comment section how you think they wrapped up, but I'm really hopeful that it kind of ties up a couple of loose ends and uh, sets us up for the next incarnation of Guardians of the Galaxy. Right, and in case you weren't aware, it's Al Ewing taking over Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Yep. When, also they're starting from issue number one again, not number 13. Yes, yes, and I, you know, I wish with the, leg, the, the legacy numbering, they feel like gives them the ability to reboot, but keep the same, um, numbering system going so that it is kind of one congruent story, but yet we're re-releasing these numbers really for sales tactics. Um, but I honestly wish they would just continue it with number 13, which is why I think stories like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 100 are so epic because we're just not getting that these days. Exactly. And keeping with the space, we're going into Revenge of the Cosmic Ghost Rider number one. Yeah, and you know, Cosmic Ghost Rider gets overlooked at this point. It's kind of funny to say that because he was one of maybe the most um, talked about characters when he debuted a couple of years ago. But people, you know, they have short attention spans and they move on. And his books haven't equaled secondary market uh, success. But this book has had a lot of positive 
talk about it today from a reader buzz perspective, which isn't, say, atypical. Um, once that character has gotten away from um, Down in Cates, whether it was the last miniseries or whether it was the Paul Shearer kind of his, uh, Cosmic Ghost Rider destroys the Marvel Universe kind of comedy story. Um, so it, this has been kind of a change. I'm, I'm hopeful, actually, that we may be able to get some kind of consistency with this character. It really does look like this isn't, uh, again, a one-off sort of um, fly-by-night character. We've seen Cosmic Ghost Rider show up in, what, Avenger stories in um, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, you know, through the Thanos, where obviously where he debuted his own story. So, I mean, I, I, the Ghost Rider as well. So I think, uh, I think Cosmic Ghost Rider is here to stay. Yeah, I've actually, within the past two years, enjoyed Cosmic Ghost Rider better than the, the, the normal Ghost Rider titles. But, yeah. But that could also be... Real, this one, go ahead. I would say that could also just be getting caught up in the marketing cycle of, I mean, it's just putting your face the whole time. So you kind of paid more attention. Well, for me, I kind of paid more attention to it. And I was like, wanting to see what all the hype was about. But I enjoyed the stories. Yeah, without a doubt. And this one was really good because it gave us, you know, traditional Frank Castle versus the Frank Castle that we know as Cosmic Ghost Rider. Um, and you kind of got the differences. So it, it, this was an interesting issue. Then the next one on the reader bus section is. Batman Last Night on Earth number three. All right, so this is what I referenced earlier. This is Scott Snyder. He claims it's him and Capullo's last Batman story. Um, you and I are wrestling fans, so we tend to prescribe to the old wrestling adage of never say never. Um, a lot of times when people say things like, yeah, this is my last Batman story. Scott Snyder's so young, unless he depends on making the jump to Marvel at some point, which, by the way, I would love a, say, a... Uh, yeah, 2025 trade of Donnie Cates for Scott Snyder. Let them switch and then play with the toys that the others has been accustomed to playing with. Um, I, think I thought would... you were going to say you want to see a Scott Snyder Moon Knight comic or something. Yeah, I would take it. That's what I'm saying. Scott Snyder goes to Marvel. He does all of those kind of characters um, that he hasn't gotten a chance to use. And then Donnie Cates goes and does Batman. But, um, but yeah, so he said this is his last Batman story. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if he gets inspired in the next couple of years and he wants to do another Batman story. Um, but Last Night on Earth, number three, wrapped up the three-issue miniseries. And we talked about DC Black Label consistently. Um, it's delivered from a reader perspective almost to a title. Uh, and, it's, again, it's, it's been one of the highlights, again, as we talk about the wrapping up of 2019. One of the highlights of 2019 is the DC Black Label, for sure. Yeah, I'm thinking... You talk about pros and cons, right? I'd say like the biggest con you normally hear about some of these block label books, a lot of times isn't the story. It's people still not liking that prestige format. But and I can understand that because I was I was fully the same way. But I think I compromised because once I saw there was more and more coming out in prestige format, I was like, okay, at least now if I collect them, I have storage that I can. I don't, I won't say invest in, but you know, I don't feel as much as bad putting money down to pay for storage for prestige books because you're getting more and more of them. Yeah, and I like the prestige books because we're getting these like adult themed stories, and I like the larger pictures, the more kind of vivid detail. Um, and it's like yeah, comic book IMAX. Right, exactly, and I don't mind it because you know. I don't know, I, I'm not judging any other type of collector, but I know a lot of collectors, you know, there's certain magazines, um, whether it's Foom or... Um, or like the any, Treasury Editions and stuff. Yeah, that we are always chasing them. You know, yeah, the old Marvel, um, you know, whether it's like the first Boba Fett or um, Comic Scene Magazine or any of those type of... So I've got a, always got a, a magazine short box. Um, so, you know, I had to kind of increase... The quantity as these releases have come out, but you know, uh, to me that that was always minor. I always felt like people were making kind of too big of a deal about that, but it seems to have been subsided a lot. Right. And the next book we're going to talk about on the reader buzz is probably one of my favorite books of the week, and that's Batman number eighty-five. And yeah, we will preface this uh, that I'm going to go ahead and say it, that there's spoiler alerts because there's something there's some stuff I want to talk about in here. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this on the channel that, for the most part, you guys want to hear us talk about the actual events of the book. But 
This was a sad one for me, Tom King's last issue of Batman. Um, yeah, but it ended, like, I don't think it could have ended any better. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people think it could, but I'm, I'm happy the way that his run ended on this book. The excellent ending to me only sells why it should have been let go to 100, and it should have ended the way he intended it to end. Um, and it, the fact that it ended good didn't give me the positive feeling I hoped. Instead, kind of made me bitter as a Tom King fan. Like, see, that's why you should have let this man go. That's why does, you should have had the faith in this his... man to finish his, his story. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to... It's just excited. But it does set up his, his upcoming Batman Catwoman story that he's going to tell. Right, which I think is going to get overlooked, right? Because it's going to be looked at almost similar to the way that that story arc was looked at, like just a love story. And I think a lot of people will overlook it, but I think that it's going to be um, a major, major release. So real quick, just kind of run down on this book, right? It's still told in kind of like the same fashion of the past few issues where there's some flashback or back and back and forth going on. Bruce Wayne's facing off against his father, Thomas Wayne, finally, and they're about to fight. And then old, old Batman Bruce calls in some reinforcements and he calls in his old girlfriend <laughs> and the uh, Catwoman on there. And I actually, some of the issues I thought the flashbacks were distracting. This one, I actually really enjoyed the back and forth. At some point, there's the time where it's too where I was kind of confused, like, wait a minute, is this still a flashback or is this because it kept going into it? But it came down to the ultimate showdown, and Batman, of course, comes out on top. And Batman and Catwoman are talking about getting married, but there's also some Gotham Girl stuff going on in there, right? I think yeah. there's some Gotham Girl stuff that you need to pay attention to in there because who knows what's going on with that. But the big thing is when you get to the end. And it's kind of like how you're talking about with Red Mother, where it kind of like wants the comic and it basically introduces the comic. Where it gets towards the end, it says, uh, City of Bang conclusion. And it gets into, it ties into Superman number 18 a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that that was unexpected for most of us who uh, were entering into this issue. It wasn't what I was thinking we were going to go with. Yeah. So this is definitely the spoiler part. If you don't want to know this, then, then, then mute it for a good 30 seconds. but. It shows two clowns working on some stuff and then coming out of the shadows, you don't see, you just see from like the chest down and you automatically know who it is. It's the freaking Joker. And then the two clowns mm -hmm. start talking about like, there's a, they're getting a mobile alert on their phone talking about how the identity of Superman is actually Clark Kent. And they're talking about, Hey, don't you know who the real Batman is? What if you were to do the same thing? And then Joker gets kind of pissed off and takes care of one of the workers and acts like it's going to allude to, the Joker having the punchline is what he calls it, right? Right. And the funniest thing about it, or not maybe not funniest, but the most interesting thing is that is not the Joker that we have seen previously in this Batman run. Um, the Joker that we've seen has had almost a more, I don't know, I want to say hipster, yeah. but, you know, he's had a more modern look, and this is a very, very traditional looking Joker. Um, more, I'd say, Brian Boland esque yeah joker um so could this possibly be this three joker storyline that we were kind of teased with and we haven't been followed up on um that's what i am hopeful for but either way i enjoyed the issue if you guys read this let us know what you thought um i know uh there's not much gray air in there people either like tom king's arc or didn't like tom king's arc but i thought it was a great way to go out and enjoy batman number 85 and then we got what yeah. James Tinian taking over, right? Yeah, James Tinian taking over with the next issue. Um, again, who's kind of like the disciple of Scott Snyder. Uh, you know, they started working together a lot, whether it was Detective Comics, um, whether it was some of the weekly series that DC used to do that were driving us all crazy and making us all broke. So um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what he's able to do. I have high hopes for him, to be honest with you. I, I, that softens the blow for me as a Tom King fan. Losing Tom King on the series is knowing that I'm getting James Tinian uh, following it up. Right. Then moving on, the next book. This is another one that Tuesday night started getting some information leaked on the interwebs. And we're talking about Black Panther number 19. Right. And so, you know, there was a lot of buzz around Black Panther number two several months ago. And this featured a kind of symbiote version of... Um, 
of uh, Killmonger. And I was pretty negative about it because my whole thing was everybody's a symbiote, which for the record is still kind of my philosophy. Um, it's very hard for me to get excited about like, this character got a symbiote, that character got a symbiote. It feels a little bit like, um, you know, an Oprah promotion. And a after a while, had, had, how are any of them special, right? What's the longevity of any of them? But in this issue, the Killmonger and Killmonger symbiote character was resurrected, came back. It's certainly, I think, going to pop those issue number twos on the back issue market. Um, I think that makes issue number two really a more important book, more than it does make, making this issue itself important because it's not a first appearance. Um, it's really a true reader bus book where something within the book happens, which catches the attention of the secondary market. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. You know, and again, I... I won't doubt, deny that if you bought into those Black Panther number twos um, several months ago, you'd probably be able to make a nice re re return on them. Um, so in that aspect, I was wrong. In the aspect that I still don't necessarily believe in every character having a symbiote and being able to be successful long term, I still kind of feel that way. Yeah. I was reading Black Panther when it first started off with the Intergalactic thing, and then I, I lasted probably about four issues in and then i haven't read it since just um i didn't hate the storyline but it wasn't enough for me to keep up with especially with all the other books coming out so i don't have much input into this at all and i i don't me personally i don't chase all the symbiote characters so symbiote care manga i think that's a cool idea but it's just not for me so moving on this is that image we had that project christmas the cover with the the green gift wrap and the red bow on it. And there's this mystery. Well, here we have it. It is American Jesus number one. Well, this is a bummer for me, not because um, anything negative about American Jesus is just not a series I've read before. So where I was hoping it would maybe be this one or maybe be that one, um, those were all just kind of personal picks. So um, you'll have to let us know in the comment section if you were hyped about this. How did this come off to you? Cool concept. As a retailer, I love this whole idea, um, the surprise of it, this mystery box culture being so popular within the community, um, releasing this series as a mystery, I think added a kind of fun flair to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you share my kind of meh, response to it being American Jesus, or did this hype you up? Were you a reader of the first volume? Um, let us know in the comments section. And either way, I think that the series is coming to Netflix very soon. I, I believe they've already begun working on it. So um, from that perspective, this could have some legs. Yeah, it definitely threw me for a little bit. It was way outside of what I was guessing it would be, especially when we talked about it on the last call. Right. But yeah, I I didn't pick this up. I'm, I'm anxious. I'll probably try to pick it up and read it and see what, see what all it's about. But yeah, wasn't a must have for me, especially once I found out. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but this next one we're going to talk about, I did pick up, but shamely, I haven't had a chance to read it. And we're talking about Teen Titans number 37. We're talking about who is the other, right? Right. And uh, even once they revealed it, I was still kind of like, who? So uh, it's, it's one of those ones where uh, DC is pulling from a small character. Um, and kind of trying to make them bigger. Not even smaller than what happened with Leviathan, but similar to Leviathan, where they're taking Mark Shaw Manhunter, and that, you know, now he's Leviathan, and they're kind of trying to elevate him as a character. Um, I can't even remember the name of the character, help me out in the chat, who is the other, but he first appears in uh, Batman and Robin number 12. So this is, again, another issue that pops a back issue, um, where more than the events of this issue, because this is going to be kind of like, again, that cameo first full appearance debate, because uh, he did show up in the previous issue, kind of like last page, splash page, which, again, we talked about this on 3 Up, 3 Down. Cameos are starting to slowly get momentum um, and kind of winning this debate when the new books are dropping. Um, the first full movement is getting kind of losing steam uh, with the newer releases, and they're kind of being looked at as like, wow, that guy already appeared which is kind of that common sense logic. And I don't, at the end of the day, I'm happy to see it. But either way, this is more about the reveal of who is the other. Now, do you think this might have some lasting or some staying power within the Teen Titans? Because you look at the rogues gallery, right, for Teen Titans, 
there's some there, but it's not like massive or a lot of people that you know about. Of course, the one right off the top of your head would be Deathstroke, right? But do you think this is someone that might stay in that rogues gallery or do you think this might kind of no, fizzle I think, out? I think yeah, it has some staying power ability because of what you said. Like they're, they're the only long term villain associated with Teen Titans is Deathstroke. And it doesn't matter what incarnation of the Titans they've done, whether it's the Teen Titans cartoon, the Teen Titans Go children's cartoon. Whether it's Titans on the DC Universe app, they have consistently gone with Deathstroke. Deathstroke has died already in the DC Universe app. They're going to need new um, villains and really like Brother Blood, um, Dr. Light. Um, and they've already done Dr. Light. They kind of burnt through that. So um, I think that some of the more modern villains are going to be ones who kind of get looked at. So I think it's anybody's ballgame. And the Titans series has become kind of uh, more of a fan favorite than it was when it first started. So. You never know, and I think that these characters, we talk about world building a lot. So that's, again, another constant trope we talked about in 2019 when you have characters that are popular. Like, Teen Titans are certifiably popular. And you got to look around and see what else you have to work with. Do you think that we're getting to a point where TV shows are influencing comics more than comics are influencing TV shows? Do you see this as a character that could show up and in, in – DC Universe Titans show. Yeah, I think that they, it could happen quickly. Look at look at Flash, right? Yep. Flash has blood work as God one of speed. the main villains. Yeah, and Godspeed. And these these are characters that are real new. Godspeed started with issue number one. Blood work didn't come until issue thirty two. Yeah. So here we are on issue um, eighty, and you're talking about a, a book that releases twice monthly. So you're only talking about a couple of years. And boom, we're right there with blood work. So these shows are looking for anything. They're when they're mining for characters, they're looking for anything that creatively works. And I think at this point, anything new is just a fair game as anything old. And that that's gonna wrap up our reader buzz section. But don't go anywhere, because we're going right now into that variant buzz section. Then that first book we're talking about on the variant buzz section is that Marvel Action Spider-Man number 12. This is the one in 10 incentive from IDW, right? Great. Now, I'm not shocked about the response to this one. Obviously, it's been popular. Um, but each one of these issues going from 10 to 11 to 12 have dropped in price from a previous issue once they've been released. Um, we know about, obviously, number 10, a book we told you about, FOC. Uh, we gave you fair warning. It was a book that I said I'd been waiting to talk about. Um, and we told everybody to get your hands on that book. That book will end up going, what, like $150, $175 at its height before dropping down to just below 100 Either way, a 1 in 10 incentive that's probably still trading for a 6 to 7 times ratio. Um, and then with the next issue, issue 11, again, we, we were very strong on it. Um, issue number 11 was for like 45 50 And now issue number 12 is hitting about 30 and I've heard people kind of be negative about that. And it's funny, that's three times ratio. So the difficulty is people are buying into it at these inflated dealer prices, right? Dealers are offering them for $30, $40, $50 upon release. And they're trading on previous releases. But that's the thing is because more people are aware of them, the print run goes up and it's the old supply and demand curve. So um, the, the demand still far outweighs the supply, which is why the three times ratio. But you're not getting kind of the you know return you would be getting especially if you're buying prices so high it's important to remember that a retailer can buy 10 copies of marvel action spider-man and qualify for one of these incentives by spending 20 dollars. so they're looking to make a return on that investment right off the bat just by selling the, the variant and that's where you're seeing that 30 or 40 dollar price coming yeah and either way and also I'm, I'm a grown man, but I still love these stories. But what I want to say is if you have that like eight to 13 year old kid and you're trying to get him in the comics, this is one of the perfect series for that. I mean, I, my six year old's more into this type of stories than my eight year old, my eight year old, like we've talked about is all about dog man and captain underpants. But if you have mm -hmm. that tween or whatever you want to talk about that 10 to 13 year old, these are some great stories. Also, if you're trying to get, if they're interested in getting into comics. Yeah, and we've also said when we talked about um, the upcoming new number one, right, the reboot series of the same title, 
We said that it's important to note that these are not kids' books. Um, they are all ages books. Right. And what that means is, yeah, that yes, they're for kids in that they're, they're more accessible to children. You're going to see, <clears throat> excuse me, less, say, death. You're not going to see death in these books, right? You're not going to see some of the dark storylines that we're used to seeing within the Marvel Universe. But you're going to get more like, think about the animated cartoons. Um, there's certainly a ton of adults who are viewing these animated cartoons, think into the Spider-Verse. That's the feel you're going to get with these Marvel action Spider-Man um, series from IDW and any of the series, whether it's the Avengers or the Captain Marvel, that's what you're going to get. So I think a lot of people are, are overlooking them for, and, and because they attach them to being a kid's title and they're not enjoying them. And there's some great stories being told. Right. And sticking with the variant buzz and sticking with IDW, <laughs> Glow versus the Babyface number two. This is the one in ten and center for that, correct? All right, this is another book we talked about uh, pre-FOC. We said uh, Catherine noted has kind of been on fire, um, you know, ever since she kind of hit the scene. It's starting with IDW. Now her dynamite work is starting to get attention. I think it's only a matter of time before she's working for Marvel and DC. Um, her cover art, especially her drawing of the female form, realism is to the max. And I think that that is what has been so popular on the secondary market. Um, they're not overtly sexual, like the way men tend to draw women, very attractive women on these covers, but they're not kind of like in your face. And uh, the f almost photorealism of her style has been incredibly popular. So this is the second successful selling, um, above ratio selling, secondary market issue of Glow versus Babyface again from Amy Garcia, from Lucifer and AJ Mendez, um, former WWE Women's Champion. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's funny talking about more life like that made me think about what we were talking about earlier. If you look back at the Black, the Black Widow cover there, mm -hmm. not so much, but yeah, <laughs> far different right there. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this next book, we always say that this is the people's list. This comes from social media a lot. This next book we're going to talk about does come from social media, but I'd be lying if saying it wasn't one of my favorite. And we were talking about that King Thor number four. This is the regular price Del Mundo variant. There was yeah. an incentive variant for this, right? But, I mean, Jason Aaron, all the characters, this one when we saw it, when it was first put in previews, hit in FOC, we, you and I sat there and had a conversation about how great this cover was. Right, and the reason why this is, when we talk about social media causing a buzz, it's not just collectors or speculators or investors it's also the creators and publishers themselves and this was one that was shared by a number of creators who, could, who really appreciated this variant um you think about uh, donny kate shared it uh, on his twitter um several others did the same because you think about first off they have respect for jason aaron with the, the work jason aaron's done um yes i think the movies have helped but Jason Aaron's writing on Thor has taken Thor from, and I know people are going to get bought her when I say this, but legitimately like a C-list level character at, at the point where he took him over. Um, a lot of the characters that have become so beloved due to the MCU, whether it's Incredible Hulk, whether it's Thor, th these were characters that traditionally were not moving major units for Marvel. They have had moments moments in time um where they're popular and yes the jack kirby art is classic and yes the you know simon and stuff is classic but it, it still hasn't ever been the type of thing where this was a cash cow for marvel and um jason aaron's work in time with thor once i think you prospectively get beyond it is going to be looked back as quite possibly the greatest ever and i think that several other writers sat back and looked at you know this image where you see all of these characters that he's played with some of which he's created and i think you could it would be nice to see maybe if donny cates can get that kind of longevity with venom um could we see the same kind of variant um and it's that kind of thing where i think a lot of other writers respected it thought it was cool it's an interesting way to bring jason aaron into the story and i think a lot of people don't realize Jason Aaron's contribution to the character as a whole. And so much of what we've seen from Thor in the movies, I think, has been pulled directly from some things that he has written. So very cool. Um, and this one got immediate buzz. And it was immediately one that Brian and I, like you said, had a conversation. We were like, 
I get it. As fans, I just think this is a cool cover. And there's, I'm not a huge CGC SS guy, but man, is this a book that I would love to have signed by Jason Aaron with his actual picture on it. This would be a great, him and Mike Del Mundo double signature SS would be amazing. Yeah, this is when we talked about regular price, but I still pre-ordered it at Third Eye because I wanted to make sure I got hold of a copy. <laughs> We were on the next book we're going to talk about is Joker Killer Smile number two. Some people were soliciting this as a Jeff Lemire variant, but it's actually a Carrie Andrews variant, right? Right, right. Yeah. So um, all of the solicits essentially said Lemire. Um, looks like it was Carrie Andrews. Um, but this has got an amazing kind of like nostalgic diner feel to it. A uh, great concept cover um, showing kind of like the main Batman rogues gallery with Joker and Harley and Two-Face and Penguin and Bane um, gives you that kind of almost uh, Saturday Evening Post sort like of effed up episode of Alice. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, so definitely a kind of cool concept cover. Another one, regular price cover, not one that you'd expect to see um, sell huge on the secondary market. It's a really cool PC pickup. Right. Then the next one, this is another one of my favorites this week. This was. If I were going to pick, you know, Jack has his long-term play of the week. But this to me would be like, hey, I like this for my long-term. Especially with this is the Star Wars Rise of Kylo Ren. These are the variants for it. There's a John Tyler Christopher action figure variant. Then I believe the next one was a 1 in 10 and then a 1 in 25, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And the 1 in 25 is the one that um, has gotten, say, the most attention, um, albeit maybe still... Uh, almost underrated, I think, because it, it this, this series has it all, right? You're talking about from a perspective of, we've talked about 1 in 25 incentives coming from Star Wars and the fact they get overlooked a little bit. This is one Brian and I, you and I talked about for a couple weeks now. We were like, this this one has that makings of a book that could do well. Um, but also from a reader bus perspective, right? Because we're going to the whole Ben Solo story. Yeah, there's a lot of good and, backstory in here that ties into the movies, right? Yeah, so we're I'm, we're all kind of in that mood, right? We're watching Mandalorian. We've got the new Star Wars movie out. Um, it's an exciting time if you're a Star Wars fan. So this kind of all felt like something that would work. Sure enough, that 125 selling for sixty dollars the day of release. Um, so congratulations to those who pre-ordered it. You're looking at at least a double up, and that's right off the bat. And it's it the potential for this is kind of limitless, especially depending upon. If that reader buzz continues through issue two, three, and four, keep an eye out for those one twenty five. Just do more. Yeah, we'll say like because I looked late Tuesday night because I pre ordered one from Third Eye, and I just for giggles looked late Tuesday night and third, uh, Midtown site, and they actually still had some available. Um, I don't know if they still are or not, but if they're selling for that much, most likely they aren't. Either way, great backstory with Kylo, or as you can say, Ben Solo. But even more, you got that backstory with Snoke, right? Right, right. And, and we're all kind of feeding for more Snoke information. I think that the whole Star Wars fandom wants more Snoke. So this is kind of like that perfect um, kind of perfect blending of what the fans want to see. And then we very well could have seen some of this on the big screen. Then the next one, the variant buzz, we're talking about Conan Serpent War. This is the one in 50 variant for this. Right, I think it's a, a Yoon variant. I'm yes. not sure how yeah, you pronounce that first part of that. But um, this was one that was you know, heavily shown in the solicit. Um, heavily, um, kind of, people were aware of it. And uh, kind of quietly has snuck up on people. And that's why I said when the, the show started that, um, you know, this was a heavily, kind of looked at it as a very, all right, uh, rear buzz. I see a lot. it. I see it being carried by the art alone. I haven't read the second issue, but like I said, the first issue I wasn't too impressed by. So unless the second issue really picked up, I see this being popular by the art and then the fact that the print run probably dropped drastically between issues one and two. Yeah, no doubt. This is definitely one where I think the art is the reason for the popularity. But we were seeing pre-orders on like $75 on this book. Um, so we were getting kind of similar to what we were seeing with the other now has happened um and it happens less with star wars right because the people are buying and keeping 
which is when you have people making art plays like this one, tends to be more of a speculative market. So now we're starting to see some of those price drops down to like 50, 55. So it'll be interesting to see which direction this goes. Does it dry up and raise in value as a lot of variants like this can? Or does it become a book where like the only people buying it were people who are trying to be sped to live on whether or not this would rise in value. And now that they see some of these $45, $48, $55 listings, will they back off and then this one will drop? And if it does, if you're a Conan fan and it drops and it gets down to like in the 30s level, it could be a good pickup. And that's going to wrap up the Variant Buzz section. So real quick, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button for us, and let us know in the comments what books did you guys get this week? What were the books that you liked that didn't make it on the list? I'll tell you right now, one of the books that wasn't on the list, and Jack and I talked about before recording this, Folklords number two. If you're not reading Folklords, love that story. Issue number two is just as good as the first, and it's starting to get a little bit darker in there. I mean, there's some crazy stuff going on in the woods. You don't know what's going to happen, but it looks like we got some, some Hansel and Gretel instead of Hansel and Gretel. Cause right. That Hansel is so hot right now. It was a, it, it was, a, it was a great read and another book that seems a little bit underprinted. Um, you know, there's so many people who kind of get on these balloon releases for issue number one and they're in it. We, I've talked about this before. You got kind of like different categories, whether it's readers, um, collectors, speculators, investors, flippers. And it seems like a lot of the latter jumped in on folklore's no one and now have kind of walked away and they're leading us readers to to this book. But I, I tell you it was a great book. And another thing, Brian, you know, these uh the, I think the way this story's gonna go, if folklore's ends up being adapted for a film at some point or a TV show, we're meeting new characters with every issue. Because that's the say the nest the essence of the journey. I think that's going to lead for some first appearances. Yeah, I, like some Guillermo del Toro type story going on there. But right. either way, I mean, that was one of the books that I would also read that wasn't on the list, but I still enjoyed it um, purely. And I'm speaking purely from story and reader. If, if you like those good fantasy stories, definitely check out Folklords. Uh, but with that being said, Jack, I think it's time for your long term play of the week. And we are talking about, we made it. The clock has been ticking forever, but yes. we made it to the last issue of Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock number 12. Right. So Jeff John's kind of epic story that began, as you mentioned, uh, quite some time ago at this point, has finally reached its conclusion. Um, I've been a big fan of this series. I've really enjoyed it. Having said that, I've mentioned this before that I've struggled with each passing issue um, to say retain the story with all that you're reading as far as these numerous comic releases. The amount of times I've had to go back and reference things. Um, I've even gone back and reread Watchmen over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think that this story is going to do better with the passing of time. Um, I think that as people have a chance to maybe reread it via trade, or read it for the first time via trade, I think they're going to realize what a great job Jeff Johns did carrying on the lore of The Watchmen. And I really compare it to The Watchmen TV show. Because I got to say, like, yeah, it has nothing to do with The Watchmen TV show, by the way. But I mean, what I mean by that is it is so difficult to take a comic that m most people would call it the greatest comic book of all time, of like the modern like, superhero comics. Um, it's it's listed atop most of those type of lists, and if it's not in the top one, it's in the top five. Um, Alan Moore has straight said publicly, like, don't touch it, leave it alone. Uh, before Watchmen didn't go well, and then um, for them to take on the Watchmen in a, a TV show after a movie that was kind of so-so, and then a new comic book series and to integrate it into the DC comics lore. Um, it had failure written all over it. And really the only negative that you can bring up for this entire series has been the release schedule and the release schedule has been a disaster. Um, some of it may have been timing because they wanted to time in with do more and everything else that was going on in the DC uh, universe on the publishing side 
Some of it may have been just the way in which these massive events go, right? We've seen this before, especially with DC Comics. Um, but that's really the only negative. Um, from a positive, look, on the secondary market, the early issues are all selling for over cover price. So issue number one selling well over cover price, kind of three times cover price. Um, they, now they do have a higher cover price at five ninety nine an issue. Um, the variants have done well. Um, this issue we get the, the blank yellow variant, which is selling for over ten dollars um, pretty consistently. Um, I think it's been kind of the most popular book. We talked about leading the reorders on the FOC list. It was the highest reordered book from that previous week, um, meaning that stores put their initial orders in and then kind of panicked, like, well, we need more of this book. And yet there still seems to be almost a shortage of this book. And it's why this book is selling for nine and change, eight and change, 10 and change on eBay. Um, and I think that it's, it, there's going to be some crazy sketches on this. Um, as far as the story goes, I think they did a good job closing all of the different loops that they've opened throughout the series. Um, this series also introduced us to characters like uh, Mayim and Minette. Um, I probably pronounced that completely wrong, but um, as well as giving us a new character per se in this last issue uh, and leaving us with kind of some intrigue of where they're going to go as we have this young boy who says his name is Clark, um, who has kind of the Dr. Manhattan forehead deal. And, uh, you know, he says that's what John calls him. So who is he? Is he to say redo of Clark Kent? Um, is this, uh, you know, a kind of hybrid, like we've seen hybrid characters? Um, is this Dr. Manhattan as Clark Kent? And it could leave for future stories. Um, it, this, the Watchmen deal with, with in the DC universe could not be done. Um, but either way, I think they did a great job. I think the covers are fantastic for this issue. I really love the, just the one with the Superman S, bloody reminiscent of the, uh, the smiley face. I think that that's, that's great. I also love, of course, the other one with the Dr. Manhattan and kind of like Superman looming large in the background. Um, I think they did a great job. So this is a tougher week for a long-term play. You're not looking at any issue where you say, you know, there's first appearances every week. So there's every week there's a book you could say, well, any first appearance could be a long-term play. Um, but if I look at this list this week, there's not a book where I go, yeah, that's, that's you know, for sure an investable book. But this is a book I look at and I go, I think people are going to be building this Doomsday Clock set for years. I think Doomsday Clock is going to be one of those sets like Crisis, like Absolute Carnage, like uh, Secret Wars. Um, like Civil War, that's going to be put together for a number of years. Um, I think that that first appearance at the end of the book could lead us anywhere um, and give us a little extra credence. But I think, nonetheless, that this is going to be a book that's going to be a part of a lot of sets and will probably dry up over time. And it's just going to take some time because these books have had um, large print runs. But you mentioned Nick from Slab Heroes in his YouTube channel. One thing he's talked a lot about is the difference between a high print run and supply and demand. Like just because a book has a high print run, it may also have a high demand, um, which makes that book less available over time. And like this, Spider-Man 300. Right, Spider-Man 300, New Mutants 98. Um, a lot of times when books come out and they have high print runs, kind of a novice investor will write that book off right off the bat and say, you know, It'll never be popular. But if you did that, we wouldn't see, you know, Secret Wars selling for $25 right now. Um, that's a book with a high, high print run. At one point, it was everywhere for $5 or less. Um, and we found it in dollar bins back 10 years ago. Um, but and that's why I believe in, say, like, Absolute Carnage, number one. I believe in Doomsday Clock, number one. And for the same reason, while Doomsday Clock, number 12, isn't a sexy number one, it's the wrap up of, of the set that I think is going to be iconic. It has a first appearance in it. Um, and it's got a variant in that blank variant that every time somebody draws on it, it's going to be less and less and less and less common. And we've seen some of these blanks get kind of high up in value as that has happened, especially ones that are lower printing. And while this one is, like I said, maybe a higher printing than a lot of them, I think it's going to have a lower printing than the demand for it. 
I think it's a great long-term play. You know what else I think might be a good long-term play is the first when it comes out in trade. This might be one of those trades where they're, of course, probably going to come out paperback before they come out the hardcover. But this is going to be one of the one of those that goes great collected as a trade, especially since it took so long to come out. People mm-hmm. are going to want to revisit it, reread it, and you get some of those trade paperbacks that you never know um, gain value over time. Either way, from a reader perspective, I'm definitely picking up. I'm going to probably wait for the hardcover edition just because I love this story. You couldn't ask for probably one of the better creative teams for this because you got Jeff Johns and Gary Frank, right? Right. It sucked that there was some release, I don't want to say issues, but you know they didn't come out like you would like them to. So there's some stalls in between. But either way, if you start from the first issue to the 12th issue, you have a great story in between. And it's for good reason. They're not going to trust just anyone to to steer this ship with this the storyline with these characters in it, but great long term play I think I think it was great Jack. Nice, nice. And that wraps up our bolo list for tonight. So then again we've been saying it throughout the whole show. Put it down in the comments. What books did you guys pick up this week? Also, what books are you looking forward to? There's a bunch of great books coming out. We're getting ready to hit a new year. I will tell you, Jack and I both are going to shoot separate videos for our top 10 series of 2019 so be on the lookout for that and just a few more shopping days left for christmas guys if you're looking for those gift ideas we have a video on here for that comic book lover on the channel we have that gift guide we'll put that link to that in the description and remember no bolo show next week but there is going to be a list so be on the lookout for that on social media as well as simplemanscomics.com jack is there anything else you want to say well, I just wanted to say um, I hope everybody has a uh, good holiday. Um, like we said, we won't be here next week. Um, I would love to know also in the comment section, are there any books coming out next week that you've got your eye on? I've got my eye on that uh, kind of premiere variant for Venom number 21 that has that Clayton Crane Skull Island kind of cover that we saw depicted in all of the previews magazines. That's the one I've got my eye on. Um, but what do you guys have your eye on for next week? Yeah, so I also want to take the time again. Thank you, the show sponsor, Slabbed Heroes. And I also want to thank an overall channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys, the viewer, for watching. If you're listening to this on the podcast, definitely appreciate it. And tune in tomorrow night because we have the last call where we are talking about books that are heading final order cutoff this coming Monday night. And until then, we will see you guys in the next video.